Mediterranean. Destination of wildlife filmmaker Thomas Behrendt and home to animals you wouldn't expect to find here. An exciting quest for the biggest and the rarest sea mammals. The expedition will travel from the craggy coastline of Greece to the steep cliffs of West Africa. With a team of top experts in sea mammals, Thomas Behrendt is on his way along the cliffy coast of Greece. The German spends much of his life at sea, but this journey is unusual. He is on the trail of a giant and a phantom. Six million years ago, the Mediterranean was still dry. It wasn't until it became a sea that marine animals moved into it from the Atlantic via the Straits of Gibraltar. One of these ancient travelers appears, a female loggerhead turtle on her way to the beach where she was born. The research vessel Nereus. On board, Thomas Behrendt and Greece's leading expert on sperm whales, Alexandros Francis. Their goal is to document the secret life of these Mediterranean giants. You know, almost everybody I told about going to the Mediterranean to see sperm whales was laughing about me. And, but they are here, aren't they? Yes, of course they are. And we get the same reaction when we say that we are studying sperm whales in the Mediterranean. But if I look to the, the Mediterranean, which is comparably shallow and small, mm -hmm. can it really host sperm whales? Uh, yes, of course it can, because the Mediterranean is not so shallow. We are very close to the deepest point of the Mediterranean, which is uh, 5,125 meters. It's a lot. And all along the Hellenic Trench, this is what we find. The most important for the sperm whales, it's not the depth, it's the steep uh, slope at the end of the continental shelf. This is important for them. We will go all along the Hellenic Trench and hopefully uh, I'm practically uh, certain that we will find sperm whales. Let's go. <laughs> okay, let's go. It doesn't take long to find the first signs of life. The expedition encounters the most common sea mammals of the Mediterranean, a school of dolphins, including calves. Although baby dolphins are suckled by their mothers for the first year, they have to swim with a pod as soon as they are born. But the team isn't here to play with dolphins. They want to track down whales. For this purpose, a hydrophone is being prepared. What is the reason that the, the sperm whales uh, do this clicking? Well, they produce clicks because they, this is the way they can see their environment. They send these clicks, and from the echo, they can receive information about the distance of any ob object. Well, this is the way they navigate, they find their foods, they understand that there are enemies around, etc. Mm -hmm. And our chance to find them. Exactly, <laughs> from these clicks. The hydrophone, basically a hose containing two microphones, trails in the water 100 meters off the stern. But today, the gods seem to be against them. Alexandros is steering a zigzag course, constantly veering this way and that. Alexandros, uh, why did we move like this? Is there any reason? We have this search pattern here. Oh yes, today it wasn't, it wasn't easy. And this is because we heard them ahead. But ahead means 
at almost 180 degrees ahead of the boat. So we don't know if they are really ahead at the left or at the right. And we should check all these possibilities. And any sperm whale clicks? But, but I, yes, uh, I, I just start hearing some faint clicks far away. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. We have sperm whales ahead. Alexandros instructs the crew to keep their eyes open. Spotting whale spouts on such a vast expanse of water takes a lot of experience. Blow ahead, two whales appear at the surface. Sperm whales? They jumped up over. It's the filmmaker's lucky day. Just two hours on the sea and yeah, already yeah, yeah. the sperm really whale. Like... Oh, do you think we can try to go in the water with them? Yeah. If this goes on for a few more minutes, it would be a nice opportunity to, to try a first dive. Alexandros won't permit diving until the whales have got used to the boat. You can start preparing. It's yes, the perfect moment. Of... But the animals are just not cooperating and disappear. Are the whales close again? If the tailfin appears, the whale is hunting for squid. It won't turn up for another half hour. And where exactly, only the whale knows. But they go down. They don't like it. The next opportunity. But behind Thomas's back, the whales are doing as they please. Oh no! They dive again, huh? That's it. Okay. Too late. An everyday story for a wildlife filmmaker. Some days later, the craggy coastline of Greece. Stretching over thousands of kilometers, it's the ideal habitat for the monk seal. So rare, it could almost be described as a phantom. Thomas hopes to find the animal with the help of Vasidis Kouroutos, the Greek leading expert on monk seals. But it's a game of luck, especially in the spring. The best chances are in autumn during late September, October, no November, because at that time the mothers give birth to their pups, and as they are really good mothers and they have to stay with their pups, they spend much time inside their shelters uh, nursing the pups, so we have many more chances to see them than now. And if I would go into the water right now, and do I have any chance to film? No to chances, them? no chances. It's like a, a needle in a, in a barn. Thomas and Vasilis are traveling to the Alonisus National Maritime Park, the only one in Greek waters designated for the protection of monk seals. They want to install a remote-controlled camera in a cave visited periodically by seals. The men chose springtime, as this is the season where the caves are usually free of seals. Nevertheless, they proceed cautiously. A sudden movement grabs Thomas's attention. He makes a surprising discovery. A male monk seal has taken shelter in the cave, but why? Vasilis is worried and looks for clues in the seal's behavior. So as not to disturb the seal, the men decide to wait some distance away. The caves are the seal's last refuge, but weren't their original habitat. 
the old times, they were giving birth to open beaches. But now, due to the change of the habitat, because they were pushed, let's say, from the human disturbance to change their way of life, now they give birth to inside caves, which are very unsafe, unsuitable for the babies. Because in case of stormy weather, then the waves are crashing into the, the caves and the baby might drown. But if it was born on a beach, then in case of stormy weather, as you understand, it would just go further up to the beach and no harm, nothing. It will be safe. The next morning begins with a dive into the fascinating world inhabited by the seals. Thomas soon finds the entrance to a cave. It's a dark world, but full of life. Caverns like these are favorite resting spots for monk seals, but the only animals the filmer discovers are sponges and anemones. A slipper lobster hides in the darkness, a delicacy for humans and monk seals alike. The beam of Thomas's torch picks out shrimp clustered together at the far end of the cave. A forked hake seizes its chance. The cave is home to all kinds of creatures but no monk seals. This inhabitant of the sea is certainly no friend of seals. Octopuses are rarely seen in daylight, preferring the safety of the night, with good reason. They can change their color to match the background. Studies show that today around half of monk seals' diet consists of octopus. Fish, the normal diet of seals, is hard to find because the Mediterranean has been practically fished to death. As the octopus settles almost directly on top of Thomas's camera, it's evident that some of its arms are damaged. It may well already have experienced an unpleasant encounter with a monk seal. At sunset, the expedition leaves the island to spend the night in a small port. Idyllic appearances can be deceptive. Overfishing in the Mediterranean is threatening wildlife and local fishermen. Many species are being driven towards extinction. But there is still hope. New life will emerge tonight. The new arrivals are loggerhead turtles. A dangerous journey awaits the tiny amphibians. Even those who survive will not all reach adulthood. But the females who make it will return to lay their eggs on the beach where they were born. After the run of bad luck with the sperm whales, Thomas and Alexandros decide to try a different whale territory. They travel on to Crete. Greece's largest island is a windy place. Meltemi, the summer wind, sweeps through the Aegean from June to September and is responsible for Crete's blue skies. Some days it brings force eight winds and a rough sea.
for the next few days, the crew is stuck in port. For Thomas, the situation is frustrating. Time is slowly running out. With each day that passes, the chances of Thomas getting any sperm well or monk seal footage at all are growing slimmer. And each new day puts ever greater demands on his creativity. to reality. Giant squid is the favorite food of sperm whales, but the sea around Greece is too salty for them. So what are these whales hunting? Thomas hopes to find the answer at the local fish market. Much of the fish here is flown in from Africa. The overfished Mediterranean can no longer meet the needs of the many tourists. It takes Thomas a while to find what he's looking for. Not exactly plentiful. A sperm whale needs between 500 and 1,000 kilos of squid a day. Eventually, the weather improves, and Thomas can return to the Nereus. Hi, Thomas. <laughs> Good to see you again. How are you? Welcome back. Fine, fine. And you? Fine. I'm fine. Everything good on the boat? Yes, of course. So let's have some sperm whales, huh? OK. <laughs> Will the team be any more successful this time? Alexandros has been on research trips during which he didn't see a sperm whale for three weeks. Today, however, luck is on their side, and they encounter their first group of whales in the morning. This time, the whales are more trusting. They don't flee and even show an interest in the ship. Alexandros can get some pictures. These seem to be old acquaintances. Yeah. Ah, I think this is Pilos group. If this is Pilos group, it's the best known. Studies show that Mediterranean whales never cross into the larger Atlantic Ocean. The small population seems to live in total isolation. The crystal clear water allows the whales to be identified even at some depth. The adults are about 10 meters long. Almost the whole group has dived leaving only two whales on the surface. And these are a calf and a juvenile, probably, these two whales. Waiting at surface for the, for mother, the mother to, to return. Come. But the baby will, be, will never be left alone, is that right? Uh, well, it depends. It happens when we are for many hours with the whales and they are uh, adapted to our presence. They leave sometimes the, the baby close to the boat and they go die. Do they leave it and, and, and they, they are not afraid? They trust us, actually. Oh, yes, okay. yes. Mm -hmm. A major cause for the recent decline in sperm whales, they get entangled in high sea drift nets used for catching swordfish. Recovery is slow, especially for the small population in the Mediterranean. Why do they try to stick out their head? How oh, they are inspecting the boat. It's the only position where they can see stereoscopically with both eyes. They have 3D vision. Because of the big head, in all other directions, they can see either with one or with the other eye. So when they want to inspect something better, they stay like this and they look ah, towards okay. the lower jaw. Okay.
For the first time on the expedition, the whales are not preoccupied with hunting. They've come together for a rare meeting, an ideal opportunity for Thomas to get some unique footage. OK, be ready. Go. Diving among these gigantic creatures is a humbling experience. Thomas approaches them with respect. The animals are enormous and much, much faster than a diver. It would be the easiest thing in the world if they wanted to attack him. The whales turn to the camera and inspect the alien visitor. For Thomas, it's a strange feeling. He wonders what the whales think of him. And will they just keep watching him, or is there going to be some other reaction? Then the giants bunch up close together. The behavior of whales is mysterious. Thomas doesn't know what they are communicating about. But he knows that in large males, one third of the body length is used to produce sounds that pass through the huge nose, the world's largest biological sound generator. Still, very little is known about the way whales communicate. Just before the end of the dive, one of the whales below the filmer accelerates and his bulky body shoots out of the water. Yoo-hoo! Thomas's patience has paid off. He's finally got some very unusual footage. What he doesn't know is that the most exciting moment of his career as an underwater filmmaker still lies before him. A few days later, Thomas and Vasilis return to the cave where they saw the injured seal. There's no sign of it. Hoping it's made a recovery, they try to find a place for the remote camera. So, where do you think the, the mother will be? The, this rock you see over here, as we have high tide now, and this is submerged, the rock. Yeah. In September, October, it will be out of the water. So this area from over there, all the way here till down the, to there, it will be a space for the pups to lie down outside of the water. Uh -huh. And the mothers will lie down around here. And some of them, if they want to get to go to a dark place, then they can use, you see it goes the tunnel, goes a bit further up. Mm -hmm. And then they can use this place and, but to they, rest. Do you think they, do they hide inside here? Or? No, they, they, they like to put their head into the darkest place of the ah, cave. Okay. You have to always to keep in mind that during the <laughs> storm, here things are much, much different. Oh, it's not easy. Finally, they find a sheltered spot, a slanting rock face behind the cave entrance. The installation takes place in stages. First comes the noisy part. Vasilis has told Thomas that really big waves smash against the rocks and spray sweeps all over the cave. OK. If seawater gets on the lens and dries, the salt crystals will prevent the camera from capturing anything at all. OK. An aluminium plate serves as a mount. Then he installs the camera. It can be moved in any direction and includes an infrared function, 
enabling footage to be shot even in complete darkness. Later, no one will be allowed to enter the cave, so all the control and recording equipment has to be located outside. A bold venture. The cliffs above the cave rise almost vertically. Free climbing is not necessarily a filmmaker's dream. But the only reasonably flat surface to mount the solar panel for the power supply is a small plateau high above sea level. Finally, all the technical equipment has been hauled up and is ready to be installed. Without this technology, the crew would have to camp out by the cave for weeks. And the seals might get a scent of the humans, which would scare them off. A specially programmed computer can store the pictures for several days. Thanks to the internet, the footage can also be sent anywhere in the world. As soon as there is any activity in the cave, Thomas will return. A seal has been spotted off a neighboring island by a local fisherman. With patience and a bit of luck, Thomas might be able to find it. It's a game of hide and seek along the rocky seabed. Suddenly, there's a shadow. The phantom appears. his first monk seal, an adult male. Thomas scarcely dares to breathe. Should he follow the seal? It doesn't seem to feel threatened. What an opportunity. This is the footage he has so longed to get. It seems to be completely relaxed. But what do the sounds mean? The clearly audible clicking puzzles Thomas, who's never heard of such behavior. Curious, the seal approaches. A few minutes later, it disappears from Thomas's sight. Not wanting to disturb the animal, the filmmaker decides to return to the boat. Back in port, he can't wait to hear Vasilis's opinion. Well. Yeah. That's very strange. So why, uh, why why did he do that? I don't really know. You had uh, recorded something <laughs> that uh, most probably it's the first time that somebody records something like that. Showing off, is this, is this, calling something, something, maybe mating. It's not a, a hostile behavior, that's for, for sure. A new puzzle for us. <laughs> it's, it's, I'm very glad to, to yeah, hear yeah. this. New puzzle for us. The behavior of monk seals still holds secrets, even for Vasilis. Back on Alexandros's boat, the Mediterranean is a busy place, especially if you work with a hydrophone. It's too noisy, too much noise. You hear the propellers? Yeah, and this is all from this tanker ship there? Yeah, yeah, just from this boat. And you see where it is over there? It's 
sperm whales are becoming deaf. And the problem is that the collisions of vessels with sperm whales is increasing rapidly. Look here. Ugh. All these are uh, sperm whales. Y you can see the propeller marks. This they are huge. The propellers? Yeah, yeah. It, uh, actually, almost the entire sperm whale is cut in pieces. You can imagine if you have a population of just 200 animals and uh, uh, more than one per year is disappearing by a purely anthropogenic cause, then the impact to the population is, is big. It's probably not sustainable. In spite of the ship's propeller sounds, Alexandros locates sperm whales ahead. They should appear. They stopped clicking, so they should appear at surface at any moment. We have to be careful. Low, low, over there. But this time, something is different. No, no, it's not. Low. Eight whales. They are, they are really speeding. <laughs> Entire group traveling so fast. We don't understand why. Then the whales suddenly stop. A few position themselves vertically in the water. It looks as though the females are holding another of their meetings. As yet, nobody knows that their behavior has a very different reason. Thomas, it may be nice. Prepare yourself. When you are ready, you let me know. Thomas can't make out what's going on under the surface and thus has no idea what awaits him. In a hurry, he prepares for diving. You can go. The moment the filmmaker has waited for for weeks. The whales have never been so close to the boat and in such numbers. But the giants are busy. The last thing they seem to need at the moment is a paparazzo. Thomas has no clue what's going on. Unnoticed amongst the mass of gigantic gray bodies, a baby sperm whale has been born. Curious, it heads straight for the camera. Mother and aunt do not approve and begin to threaten the intruder. The females have to keep the calf near the surface so that it can breathe, and they have to deal with what may be an enemy. An aunt joins the mother. Her message is clear. Back off. The situation gets out of control. Come on the boat, quickly! Thomas swims as fast as he can. But the whales are in hot pursuit of the cameraman. Barely a meter behind, the giants chase him. If they wanted to, the whales could easily deliver a fatal bite. The boat. As the crew pulls Thomas out of the water, his camera keeps running. He is confused because it was a really nasty situation. Thomas says that one of the whales already had its teeth around his leg. Can you see the newborn that has the fin? Yes, yes, like yes. In the middle, they are protecting it. Yeah. The whales didn't want to hurt Thomas. They just wanted to protect their new family member. 
Thomas never intended to disturb the whales. But after all the commotion, it was a lucky day for the expedition and the whales. For Alexandros, this is a first. After 10 years spent studying whales, a dream has come true. Thomas is overwhelmed. As all young animals, the baby whale is very curious. It really looks fast apart, huh, Alexandra? Yeah, yeah. The newborn calf weighs about a ton and is four meters long. It spent more than a year in its mother's womb and will take another year or two suckling before it can feed itself. Thank you very much for this Thomas, opportunity. It was really, it's really amazing. <laughs> How is it for you? I mean, you've seen so many sperm oh, whales. This is something unbelievable. Two years ago, yes. the same social That's unit wonderful. gave a newborn, but it was one day old. And now it's one hour old, or perhaps 10 minutes old. That's why they were <laughs> running to gather, but because they understood yeah, yeah. one of them was going <laughs> to give birth, Thomas. Thank you so oh. much. But I, that was the most um, oh, uh, exciting experience I ever had in my life. Yeah. The crew will soon take their leave of the whales. The turbulent events they've experienced in their search for the grey giants have forged strong bonds among the team members. They're bringing back pictures that have never been seen before, and the newborn calf gives them hope that, despite the constant threats, the giants of the Mediterranean have a chance to survive. How big are the chances that the, the newborn is surviving? Here in the Mediterranean, in Greece, they have, I think, they have much more chances because there are much less predators. Of course, there are other risks from humans. And uh, of course, the mother has to, to dive to find squid in order to have meal. But if a mo the mother has a problem, another female adult will take care. This is why they have the social unit, because the social unit protects all the members of the group. The whales may have a future, but what about the seals? A few hundred years ago, monk seals would have been an everyday sight in the Mediterranean. They inhabited almost every coastline. Today, a few animals live off the coasts of Greece and Turkey. Other than that, there is only one major area they can be found, the Western Sahara. What chances of survival do the monk seals of the Atlantic coast have? Before the birthing season begins in the Mediterranean, Thomas travels to West Africa. Western Sahara is a land of extremes. One of the places in the world most richly endowed with marine life hits upon an inhospitable desert. Since the 1990s, Spanish scientists have been conducting a successful program to protect monk seals. When the seals aren't hunting, they spend a lot of time playing in the surf. Close by, a mother and her pup, something Thomas would never see anywhere else. Today, the camera mounted in the birthing cave needs a service. Upsiling down is an absolute exception. Even if the seals don't seem bothered, the scientists won't go any further.
The interior of the cave is an extremely sensitive area. One glance inside reveals why. The beach offers the animals peace and shelter. Directly above the cave is the observation station. The scientists watch events in the cave on a daily basis. The camera also allows them to identify different animals, valuable data for the scientists. Now, in October, all eyes are on the newborn pups, and there's good news. 50 pups were born this year, more than at any time in the last 12 years. It seems that the population here is growing again, a hopeful sign for the colony. A strip of coastline, six kilometers in length, is home to about 200 seals, half as many as in the entire Mediterranean. In the evening, Thomas checks his emails and is in for another surprise. This is unbelievable. It's working, you know, and we have the baby. Very nice. The cave camera in Greece shows a mother seal with her newborn pup. Thomas decides to return to the Mediterranean at once. But the weather in Greece has changed dramatically. The fall storms have begun. The pictures from the cave are disturbing. Did the pup manage to find shelter in the furthest corner of the cave? Or has something terrible happened? As soon as the storm dies down, Thomas and Vasilis hurry to the cave. No, there is nothing, and there is still a big swell. Vasilis is worried and keeps on searching. She knows, the mother knows, that it's much more safe for the animal. Now let's try to see if we can move here. Vasilis is still hopeful that the mother has taken her young one to another cave. If the pup is injured, the men have to find it as quickly as possible. The two men are extremely cautious. The last thing they want is to disturb the mother, because she might then abandon her pup. Thomas and Vasilis look in a dozen caves, both above and below the surface, always with the same sobering result, nothing. Even though they're getting further and further away from the birthing cave, they're not about to give up. It's not until they go to an island outside the national park that Vasilis finds a sign of life. There is a track that leads all the way up, and it smells. That means they slept, the animal was sleeping here yesterday. Then, at last, Vasilis finds the missing seal. It seems to be fine and shows no signs of injury. Vasilis takes a quick hair sample for genetic tests. The pup doesn't feel a thing. Then Vasilis leaves as quickly as possible.
but the young one decides to follow him. A golden opportunity for the filmmaker. As long as the mother is away, Vasilis gives him permission to dive. Maybe the baby seal will take to the water. The newborn is still on the beach. A seal, not the pup, but another young animal, a few months old. It was probably here when they arrived. Caves are often used by more than one mother seal. This allows for better protection for the young when the adults are off hunting. And then the pup appears. Unlike adults, the young are extremely curious. Playfully, they explore their surroundings, at the same time steadily increasing the length of time they can stay underwater. Scientists estimate that there are only between 250 and 300 monk seals left in Greek waters. Thus, encounters such as these are a rare delight. The pup is still young, and its mother will only leave it for an hour or two to go hunting. In a few weeks, it will be left to fend for itself for up to half a day at a time. What fantastic footage. Better than Thomas could have hoped for. The young male will grow to a length of about two and a half meters and weigh roughly 300 kilos. The female will be a little shorter and lighter. Finally, it's time to leave. That was really stunning. Good, eh? Yeah. <laughs> really, really good. Perfect. They, they swam between us. It's incredible. Yeah, yeah. And they are not afraid about it? Uh, he was, uh, it seems that he was used in our appearance. And he was not afraid. You see, he was really accustomed to our uh, presence there. So that was uh, great. <sighs> good, good. No <laughs> disturbance, nothing. <laughs> This is an experience neither man will ever forget. Back on board, Vasilis's elation gives way to thoughtfulness. Just on their book, as a lost memory, let's say. What do you think will be the, the future of the man seal? With one word I can say, not promising. There are so many things that has to be done. If I have to compare these two periods of my life and my involvement with the monk seals, I'm, I'm very disappointed because the population since 1980 has declined. What are the things we have to do? We have to do more marine protected areas, more no-take zones with corridors between them which will be connected in order also to increase the fish stock, the food for the animal, but also to apply more measurements, regulations of the human activities which is actually the main cause for the, th which threats the survival of this animal. So, and if we don't do that, then they, they might extinct? Do you think that's possible? Yes, if we keep going what we do today, which is not enough, yes, they will extinct. On the one hand, the expeditions were a great success for both scientists and filmmaker. On the other hand, they show there's still a lot to be done to save the giant and the phantom of the Mediterranean. 
German filmmaker Thomas Berendt has been fascinated by the world of the oceans since his childhood. On diving expeditions which take him all over the world, he encounters creatures which very few people have the chance to set eyes upon. Oh. This animal is it's massive. Are you sure? This time, Thomas is on the search for two mystical giants and gets closer to them than expected. Together with a team of experts, the cameraman is setting off on a quest for the mysterious ocean sunfish. The search will take them round half the globe. Thanks to modern technology, unique images are captured at depths hardly reachable for divers. Thomas tracks down another behemoth, this one in the rivers of Florida the manatee. With him are people who have made the protection of this endangered species their lives work. One, two, three, pull. The trail of the world's largest osteictai, or bony fish, leads Thomas first to California. The ocean sunfish is observed regularly off the Pacific coast. Supporting the filming is underwater photographer Mike Johnson. Mike has been photographing sunfish for 20 years and knows exactly how and where to find them. Thomas is interested in how Mike manages to get these deep sea fish in front of his camera so often. The answer lies directly off the coast. Giant seaweed, also known as kelp, covers the surface of the water. Only beneath the surface can the true dimensions of the kelp be seen, however. It reaches up to tree height, creating a stunning underwater world. The alga can reach 30 meters in height and can grow up to one meter in a single day. Balloon-like gas-filled bladders help to stabilize the stems. The kelp forest offers nutrition and protection to various life forms. Well hidden in a tangle of stipes, a kelp crab goes in search of food. The giant alga is anchored to the rocky ocean floor by the holdfast, an adhesive organ. Although it may appear otherwise, there are no roots. The alga draws its nutrition from the water through its leaf-like blades. The kelp labyrinth hides a multitude of life. To fish, like the kelp bass, it offers food, spawning opportunities, and outstanding shelter, all in one. In turn, the rich fishing grounds attract hunters, like the seal. Sea anemones trap their prey at the base while the enormous sunflower star roams through all the levels on its hunt for food. The ocean sunfish, however, is nowhere to be found. Nevertheless, its appearance off the coast is connected with the kelp forest. Tides and waves tug continuously at the 30-meter-long algae. When they tear away, they rise to the surface, 
then drift towards the open sea. These floating stipes will lead Thomas and Mike onto the trail of the ocean sunfish. We want to get out offshore as far as we possibly can in a small boat into deeper water where we're more likely to see real kelp patties. Okay. Thomas and Mike get clear of the coast. The kelp is floating somewhere far out in the Pacific. Will they find the right place and meet the ocean sunfish? The Crystal River in western Florida. Here, Thomas is in search of another ocean roamer, the manatee. The Crystal River is one of the most beautiful riverscapes in Florida. A paradise, especially for birds. Brown pelicans have spotted a school of fish. Virtually exterminated by pesticides in the middle of the last century, they are once again a common sight here. Thomas is going diving with scientist Bob Bondi. Bob knows Florida's manatees like no other. Manatees are supposed to be sea mammals living out in the ocean. So what mm -hmm. are they doing out here in, in the river? Well, they are marine adapted, but they're also very aquatic. And they will come in and utilize rivers to drink the water, to take advantage of the warm water that's there, and to look in for, for forage and other vegetation. Got a satellite picture here from the Gulf and the area. You can see manatees can move incredible distances between the panhandle in Florida, then go all the way to the tip of Florida. They can go along the Atlantic seaboard all the way up to Rhode Island if they, really? if they so desire. Mm -hmm. So their migration capability is extraordinary. Manatees are really marathoners and they can swim incredible distances if they need to and if they want to. The Crystal River is one of the most important wintering sites for manatees. The building boom of recent decades has changed the water quality, however. Now only the Three Sisters Springs are crystal clear. Bob wants to check which of his charges are spending the winter here at the Warm Springs. He's been observing them for decades. By now, they have become a part of his life. Oh, it's a privilege. I mean, face it, um, I started doing this 30 years ago, and there were a few manatees out there, but even today, there are more. And so we, we see the reaps and the rewards of what's going on with our conservation, and that's gratifying. Because they're a magnificent animal, and we have a lot to learn from them. Bob can identify individual animals based on their particular features. A waterproof pen and sketchboard are always to hand. It's basically my way of keeping notes while I'm down there. I've done the best I could to draw a silhouette of a manatee, and as I see scars on the manatee, I'll draw on each of the silhouettes and then keep track of the frames. You can see you can write down the number of the picture that I end up taking so that when I get back into the office, I can match these up. Oh, you can't help but love a manatee. They're very endearing. Old pioneers and, and sailors used to call them mermaids. You know, they must have been at sea a long, long time. But if you look at them closely and you see through uh, their funny looking face, they really are a very interesting, endearing creature. Bob's investigations reveal that these ponderous creatures can reach an advanced age of up to 50 years. Their laid back way of life often leads them into dangerous situations, as their many injuries testify. Generally, you know, no manatee is exempt from getting scars from boats that they interact with out in the environment. And as you can see, many of these manatees, if not all of them, have some evidence of their interaction with boats. Back to the wild Californian coast. Far out on the Pacific, on their search for the sunfish, Thomas and Mike are on the lookout for floating kelp. 
Mike makes the decisive discovery. Birds are really an important factor in finding kelp patties. We may not see the kelp, but we see the birds. And if we see birds together, that tells us there's probably something underneath them. It's hard for Thomas to believe that he'll encounter the largest bony fish in the world under such a small layer of seaweed. While Mike secures the boat to the kelp island, the filmmaker prepares for his dive. Under the floating seaweed, he makes a surprising discovery. This tiny island in the middle of the vast ocean has a magical attraction for fish. Shoals of sardines and perches find food and shelter in the shadow of the kelp. Thomas is impressed with the vibrant life under the seaweed canopy. Blue half-moon perches have probably traveled with the flotsam, while tree fish are hatched in the kelp. Thomas is so busy filming that he only just notices the perches swimming purposefully in one direction. Out of nowhere, an ocean sunfish suddenly emerges. Now it's obvious who the half-moon perches have in their sights. How the sunfish found the floating island remains a mystery, although the reason for his arrival quickly becomes clear. The sunfish and the half-moon perch have clearly been waiting for each other. The larger animal is seeking the help of the smaller ones to rid himself of annoying parasites. These incomparable fish communicate with a simple signal. The sunfish raises himself up and freezes. The invitation for the perches to begin the cleanup job. The skin of the common molar, as the ocean sunfish is also known, is one of the thickest in the entire animal kingdom at around seven centimeters. It stabilizes the creature's huge body like a suit of armor, but doesn't protect against parasite infestation. The secretive fish disappears from Thomas's sight as quickly as it arrived. Molars can be found spread practically all over the world, not just on the American Pacific coast. All the same, very little is known about them. In the evening, Thomas gets a call from Italy. Ocean sunfish have been seen in the Mediterranean, off the coast of the island of Elba. The filmmaker doesn't want to miss his chance and decides to fly to Europe. This search will be harder than in California, as there are no kelp islands in the Mediterranean. The team prepares in Elba Harbor. This time, the expedition will go down to greater depths. On board is underwater photographer Roberto Rinaldi. Last year, he spotted some ocean sunfish here on a deep sea dive. Roberto, I've got a map here from the, um, Elba. Do you remember where you find the sunfish? It comes very close to the, to the coast, so yeah. we just had to... The depth is pretty much because it's below 
50 meters, but we have to dive a lot and we have to stay a long time in the bottom because otherwise the, the chance we have to meet and to see this mola mola fish, I am afraid that will be always less and less because the time frame last year, it was very short. Good, then let's go. Last time, the sunfish disappeared after only three days. Thomas is relying on the remotely operated underwater vehicle. It's expected to provide pictures from the vast depths. An opportunity which shark expert Eleonora de Sabata does not want to miss. This is a chance of a lifetime. We're, we hardly ever go so deep in the Mediterranean, so anything we find out will be absolutely new to science. And molas, we know that sharks eat molas, so wouldn't it be fantastic if we saw a shark attacking a mola right in front of our eyes? Fingers crossed. The team complete, the search for the sunfish can begin. It doesn't take long for the boat to reach its destination. Close to the island, the ocean floor drops away steeply. It's too deep for longer dives here, so the underwater ROV is used in place of human divers. The team is excited, but something isn't quite right. Oh. Such a violent impact was not part of the plan. Mm. The ROV doesn't react. The two technicians are at a loss. For Thomas, it's the worst thing that could have happened. Someone must now go down and bring the device back up. Roberto takes the plunge. Only with a special rebreather set can he get down to the necessary 60 meters. And his time on the sea floor is limited. Thomas is not comfortable with the thought that Roberto will be diving solo. Da, das muss Roberto sein. After a few nerve-wracking minutes, the diver finally appears on the screen. A short while later, air bubbles indicate Roberto's ascent. He must wait one more hour to decompress, however, before he can safely return to the very surface. In the meantime, the team salvages the damaged ROV and begins the diagnostic check straight away. Towards the evening, the technicians find the problem. The drive control is broken and must be replaced, meaning a long enforced break for the expedition. Back to Florida. The manatees are still dozing in their pool. Their metabolisms are so slow that they would freeze without this natural heating system. The morning grooming routine is carried out by sunfish. They rid the manatees of algae, parasites and dead skin. As with the mola, the sloping posture of the manatee seems to incite the shoal of fish to their task. Not far away from the warm springs, Thomas and Bob Bondi discover a manatee with her calf. Thomas is amazed. They are heading straight for the two men. In winter, the creatures only leave the warm springs in order to graze on the riverbed. Manatees are the only sea mammals which live on plants. The vegetarian lifestyle comes at a price though, especially when there are young to feed. Mothers spend eight hours a day in search of food. Mm -hmm. 
manatees take every aspect of life at a slow pace, a reason why they only reproduce every two to five years. Unlike most mammals, manatees have their teats under their armpits. Their Indian name probably comes from this peculiarity. Manatee means breast. No one can distract the mother from her food, neither the calf in tow nor the diver. She only interrupts her meal for short moments to breathe. Every five to eight minutes, she replenishes her air supply. Then it's back to the guzzling. The calf has drunk the milk supply dry. Only when the mother has produced new stocks will it return. Tracking down manatees in a shallow river proves much easier than finding a sunfish in the wide Pacific Ocean. I hope this is stable enough here. Without the help of experts like marine biologist Tierney Tees, the quest would be hopeless. She is exclusively researching molars. It wasn't really until graduate school that I, I took a strong interest in them. My advisor had a little picture of a mola on his door. And <laughs> And that was just the craziest looking fish I'd ever seen. <laughs> it was a little picture for such a big fish, and, um, and I was hooked. The team wants to fix a satellite transmitter onto a sunfish. Tierney has already provided more than a dozen animals worldwide with transmitters for her research. This is a weight to carry. Yeah. So the larger the animal, the less a burden. Mm -hmm. so, um, we're looking for an animal that, that's healthy and large. Mm -hmm. That's all we need. So we look for kelp patties, we look for fins sticking up, and we listen for Darren, who's got the perspective from the sky. Darren Maurer, the pilot, has a much larger area in view from up in his plane than the team down in the boat. Darren, you picked me up on 78? Yeah, Roger, um, I'm not seeing any animals. Roger. This calls for patience. Not exactly one of Thomas's strong points. No. The hours pass with no word from Darren. Thomas uses the time to learn more about molars from Tierney. Who's, who's eating the mola? Do they have any enemies? We can see who's be eating them often. Sea lions will eat them, orcas. But the parasites can also help us. It's fun, the parasites really are, are this fun little detective story. We find shark, larval shark tapeworm parasites on mola. And so we know that for that tapeworm to complete its life cycle, it has to get into a shark, which means that a shark's gotta eat the mola. Thomas. Four, five, six, Thomas, you pick me up. Uh, I've got another animal here at 36 over 29. Roger, we'll uh, keep that in your way. Over. Will the sunfish stay on the surface for long enough? Mike pushes his little boat to the max. It's four miles to the northeast of your position. Over. We're closing on an animal 100 yards away at 12 o'clock. OK, it's off to our nine. Things have to happen quickly now. I've done it! Hold on, hold on. Where's the scalpel? Uh, right here. Tierney has problems anchoring the transmitter into the centimeters thick skin of the struggling fish. If I can get it straight down. Okay. Measure. Shock 
Dock line. Dock line. Tierney releases the fish back to freedom. Still a little dazed, the creature vanishes into the wide ocean. The transmitter will plot all of his movements before detaching itself in around three months. Roger, the tag was deployed. That's good. So your fish was about two meters. Okay. Here, look, Mike, how slimy it is. Yeah. Look here, all the slime from, I just barely couldn't hold it. They have a very thick protective coating, um, which may be a way of protecting themselves against jellyfish stings as well. But that, um, that's, that's a protective mucus coating that they um, can protect them against all sorts of infections. The injured hands are evidence of the rough skin beneath the protective mucus. The day has been a complete success for the team. Through the satellite transmitter, Tierney will get to know even more about the secluded life of the sunfish. Animals bearing transmitters can also be found in the warm springs of the Crystal River. Thomas and Bob get on the trail. It's clearly somewhere in this, in this uh, angle here. The signal is clear and distinct. The manatee must be nearby. The animals with transmitters help Bob to establish which parts of the river must be closed off to humans. So there's some site fidelity patterns that we've learned that manatees have directly from putting radio tags on them and observing these migrations that they make. It's very important because they use the corridors that are out there, the waterways that we use for our same boats. So that interaction between boats and manatees is a serious problem. So here's the entrance to the sanctuary where we might be able to see the manatee. Oh yeah, here it is. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Beneath the boy is a resting manatee with an unusual wound. We were surprised when we saw this manatee and it looked like it had a wound inflicted by a propeller. But at close examination, we determined that this was actually a shark bite. This animal had been attacked out in the marine system before it had come into Crystal River. But there's very little evidence that manatees are actually preyed upon by um, sharks and successful or by alligators. It does happen, but it's a pretty rare occurrence, fortunately for the manatees. Very close to the men, a manatee is lingering, obviously dangerously underheated. A rescue team led by scientist Andrew Garrett is aiming to capture the animal and transport it to a special manatee hospital for medical care. Thomas is up close to the action. But first, the creature has to be found. Eventually, the helpers locate the weakened manatee. A colleague signals the exact position to Garrett. The net can be brought out. Everything must happen quickly so the animal does not escape. Finally, the manatee is in the trap, but the hardest part is still to come. Go ahead, you're gonna have to take all, yeah, yeah take them both. And station your pile further forward if you can, on the other side of that pile. And then uh, Nilda and Mike, you guys are piling the other, uh, way up by that orange ball, like even further up if you can, Stacy. 
Only with combined strength can the several hundred kilo animal be heaved on board. All right, slack tail, slack tail, slack tail. All right, ready? One, two, three, pull. Got a fish too, let's get that fish out of there. Big jack. Oh. There you go. The manatee is in a critical condition. One, two, three. It requires urgent medical attention. Veterinary surgeon Dr. Murphy from the Manatee Clinic at Lowry Park Zoo, Tampa, is already waiting for the exhausted creature. He begins first aid on the patient. She's in really bad shape. It's a cold stress animal that's got a lot of infection in her tail, in her pecs. She's been like that for a while. After Dr. Murphy has given her antibiotics, the underheated animal urgently needs warmth. Her slow metabolism can only generate a meager body temperature. No, she's in critical shape. She'll, she, if, she, if she survives the first uh, few days, then we might be able to upgrade her chances of, of making it. But right now, uh, she's really teetering on the edge, and she could easily die on us in the next 30 minutes or could die on us by tomorrow morning. There is a glimmer of hope, however. The rescued animal still has a healthy appetite. Good news from Italy. The ROV is functional again and ready to go. This time, it reaches its destination without incident and provides some razor-sharp images. It's so beautiful. At 70 meters, sprawls a colorful tropical reef. Cold, oxygen-rich water generates enough nutrition to sustain an unexpected abundance of life, surprising at this depth. Only the ocean sunfish is nowhere to be seen. I think the best is we just, we just hold her here and then we pan from left to right and have an overview yes. and just wait, that's all we can do. The hours pass, yet nothing happens. Nothing. What's that? Oh. It's a mola. Oh. oh. And it's not alone. This is fantastic. Oh, not sure. Out of nowhere, three molars emerge over the edge of the reef, but they are unsettled by the ROV. Stop, stop, stop. Stay here, stay here. Yeah. Stay behind the, no, the no, sea don't fence. Don't scare him, please, please. A fourth fish now appears. Why are they gathering here at the reef? The upright posture reminds Thomas of the sunfish he observed under the kelp island in California. And true enough, like before, as if on a secret signal, a few smaller fish approach the sunfish. Isn't this uh, Chorus Eulis? Yeah, the rainbow wrasse. Here in the Mediterranean, exactly as they did off the Pacific coast of California, the sunfish are looking for particular spots at which they can rid themselves of parasites. Eleonora and Thomas are spellbound. Then comes a shout from the prow of the boat. The captain has seen a molar on the surface. Right away, everyone is on deck. Hurry up, because he's going away. Yo!
a school of pilot fish leads the filmmaker to the scene. It's a hunting sunfish. His method may seem unspectacular, but his prey is not to be taken lightly. Molars feed mainly on jellyfish and other forms of cnidaria. Although a single contact with a Portuguese man of war can be fatal for a human, sunfish gobble them up without hesitation. Their thick mucus coating offers complete protection against the blue poison tentacles. Thomas is delighted. But it won't be his only spectacular encounter today. The reason why we're going at night is that because the six Six-scale shark is, um, is an animal that lives in the depth, and then at 2,000 meters, it's, all, it's always very um, dark, it's pitch black, which is also the reason why it has such a big green eye, which is capable to see in the dark. And we're going there at nighttime because he's used, he, she, they, they are used to these kind of situations. Again, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. A night dive among sharks carries certain risks. Sometimes it can be a problem if, if the shark comes too close. For safety, Eleonora is taking along a harpoon. <laughs> okay, looks good. Good? Yeah, I think we can go. Five, three, two, one, go! In the glow of their lamps, Eleonora and Thomas begin to submerge into total darkness. The sea looks completely lifeless. At around 30 meters, they finally reach a rocky plateau. Was that a shadow? Thomas can hardly believe his eyes. Right in front of them, a mighty six-gill shark patrols the ground. At night, these deep water dwellers rise to higher levels in order to hunt. The sluggish movements are deceptive. The four-meter-long shark can swim extremely fast. Even though no attack on humans has ever been known, its size alone commands respect. The bright light of the lamps is disturbing the shark, and he seems annoyed. The team doesn't want to risk anything, so they move a distance away. Like the sunfish, the six-gill shark is found worldwide and is also a wanderer between the deep water and the ocean surface. Remains of molars have been found in the stomachs of sharks. Just a coincidence? Or does the six-gill shark specifically hunt sunfish? No one knows the answer. To this day, hardly anything is known about these mysterious deep-sea inhabitants. At the Crystal River in Florida, spring has arrived. In a few weeks, the manatees will leave their winter habitat for the open sea. Thomas wants to pay them one last visit before they disappear into the Gulf of Mexico. An animal approaches his boat inquisitively. The sirens, 
as earlier seafarers also called the manatees, are supposed to have enticed men into the water to their doom. Thomas is also powerless to resist. Hardly is the cameraman in the water than the sea maiden has vanished into a cloud of silt. As the cloud lifts, the Colossus seems to have been swallowed up by the earth. Unseen by Thomas, the manatee approaches him from behind. is surprised as the massive creature sidles up to him. And it's not alone. The calf seems to be taking Thomas for one of its own. It faces an uncertain future even more so since the explosion of the oil rig Deepwater Horizon in April 2010. At least there is good news from the Manatee Hospital. The hypothermia victim is on the road to recovery. She seems to be a winner. I think right now it's just going to, we're going to have to see if she's going to lose some of her flippers or she's going to lose some of her tail because of uh, the severe cold injury to those, those tissues. So we're just going to have to see. And another patient, baby Coral, will be released into the wild today. But she didn't have enough time to get back to warm water before it got really cold because she was radio tagged. We knew where she was. We all made a decision that the water was way too cold. She'd most likely die before she got back to the warm water site. So we went ahead and rescued her. An estimated 4,500 manatees live off the coast of the USA. In winter 2010, almost one in 10 fell victim to the cold, making the work of the hospital all the more important. With the help of a satellite transmitter, every movement of baby coral can be tracked. The data can hopefully be used to more effectively protect these friendly creatures. For baby coral, today marks the end of a dramatic odyssey and at the same time, the start of a new life of freedom. His experiences on the Crystal River have left a lasting impression on Thomas. Even though the homeland of the manatee is under threat, he hopes to see these gentle giants here again sometime. A few months later in California, now, high summer, is the best season for spotting large fish. And if there's anyone who'll find them, it's Darren. Yeah, I've seen the swordfish here and the mole as well. Right here, here, here. My chance is to see a really, really big monster mole. <laughs> how, do you, how do you think my odds are? <laughs> I would say this year, pretty slim pretty slim odds. It's just one of those years I haven't seen very many large animal. It's just been a different weather pattern we're in. The water's cooler this year, much cooler than normal. Um, so I haven't seen any. OK. So you're going to phone me huh? when, whenever you yeah. get something. OK. Darren, see you, huh? OK. okay. See you whatever. out there. Time enough for a quick trip to Tierney Tees. When the sun comes up at 6 in the morning, the mola starts diving down. The scientist has followed the travels of the tagged sunfish via satellite for the last few months. 
Thomas notices a recurring pattern in the recordings. Seems like a normal working day, huh? Going up at six. Look what we can see. The fish isn't lazy at all. It actually, it's going up and down and up and down and up and down. Mm -hmm. And to deep water targets presumably fo its food here at around 250 meters and staying there for about an hour and then coming back up. So why do they go up? Warming up like a big solar panel. There's a lot of things going on with why the sunfish is at the surface. So it could be getting cleaned at the surface by birds or by fish. It could be warming itself. Also by being at the very surface, the sun could be baking off the parasites. UV radiation. And then when the sun sets, it stays up at the surface. In the nighttime, um, so many animals migrate up into the upper waters. Mm -hmm. So while it may look like it's being restful, it could very well be eating. Yeah. Are there any more secrets you want to discover? Is there, what do you want to still find out? We want to know their behavior and their movement patterns in fine detail so that we can better inform fishermen you know, how to change their nets or how to change their fishing pressure. The mola play a hugely important role in the ocean food web because they're the world's largest jellyfish eater. Back at harbor, Thomas gets the message he's been waiting for. Hello. Darren, is it? Yeah? No, really? OK, in two hours, out at the sea. The filmmaker sets off right away, together with Mike Johnson. Flying fish, flying fish. This is Darren, you copy. I've got an animal here at 3, 6, four. OK, copy. See you there. The little boat, flying fish, heads for its objective at top speed. Are you sure? This animal is it's massive. Finally, Thomas and Mike reach the given position. Even from a distance, the filmmaker realizes what a giant awaits him. Thomas has dreamed of an encounter like this since his childhood. For months, the cameraman has been on the trail of manatees and ocean sunfish, learning much about these mysterious giants and filming hitherto unknown scenes. This meeting, however, is the climax of his voyage. It's only a few fleeting moments, but Thomas enjoys them to the full. Then the mola vanishes once again into the vast expanse of the Pacific Ocean. The northwest coast of the United States, the home of nature filmmaker Florian Grana. While dolphin expert Ute Margreff has settled in Ireland. The two German expatriates have never met, but share a common passion. Each in their own way, both have decided to dedicate their lives to the sea and its inhabitants. The rugged coastline of Ireland is Ute Margrave's second home. 
for the last 11 years, she has been studying solitary dolphins. The scientist has a special relationship with a female dolphin called Mara. Uta accompanies Mara all year round and has acquired astonishing insights. The Salish Sea in the northwest of the United States is characterized by fjords and mighty mountains. Fascinated by the untamed landscape, marine biologist and nature filmmaker Florian Grana has made a home on Puget Sound. He lives on Whidbey, one of the many islands in the region. Florian's house is only a stone's throw from the sea. German shepherd Zero is the biologist's constant companion when he sets out with his heavy camera to his favorite diving area. This is where he spends every free minute. From here, he can get straight into the water without having to carry his bulky equipment very far. While Florian dives, Ciro waits patiently on the beach. The shallow water is a very special habitat with fields of green seagrass covering the seabed. Here you see the world from a very different perspective. Golden-eyed ducks look for food near the coast. They comb the seagrass for shellfish, snails and fish spawn. Suddenly, Florian has the feeling he's being watched by a dozing harbor seal. The waving seagrass is where the seals sleep. They can stay underwater for more than half an hour. Their sedateness and chubby shape are deceptive. Seals are, in fact, extremely athletic. It takes only a few flaps of their fins to reach the deepest parts of the fjord, 700 meters under the surface. Although Florian comes across seals on almost every dive, he's always impressed by their elegance and curiosity. Some creatures are only discovered at second glance. Bizarre-looking sea slugs graze on the floor of seagrass meadows, which are home to a surprising variety of life. On the western edge of Europe, the wild coast of Ireland has been formed by the waves of the Atlantic. The Emerald Isle is a land full of myth and mystery. Some of the most astonishing stories are, however, true. In her small apartment, Uta Magrev is preparing for her daily dive. For many years, she has lived on a stud farm on the Irish coast, without ever really having an interest in horses. Uta is heading for the seaside. Her diving site is just a short walk away. Purposefully, she heads for a remote inlet, which, like so many in Ireland, is deserted. But this bay has a secret. In the year 2000, a dolphin turned up here unexpectedly and stayed. The fisherman christened the female Mara, the Gaelic word for sea. Since that time, 
Uta has accompanied Mara in all the different seasons, probably the only human who voluntarily spends up to seven hours at a time in the cold waters of the Atlantic. Every meeting begins with an extensive greeting ritual. Normally, dolphins live in groups or pods. Uta will probably never know why some dolphins, like Mara, get separated from their families and seek contact with humans. Over the years, an unusual and close relationship has developed between Uta and Mara. This unconventional behavior is great good fortune for the scientist, who can thus accompany Mara in her underwater world. The Atlantic is cold, but highly nutritious, good conditions for a wide variety of wildlife. Dolphins, however, aren't universally popular. Mara's neighbors are mostly crabs that look for food near the coast. For Uta, the excursions with Mara are a unique opportunity to explore the underwater world through a dolphin's eyes. For hours, Mara shows her human companion around her realm of seaweed and rock. Boredom is a foreign concept. She wants to explore and discover everything. But Mara's sociability is not to everyone's liking. A young spider crab evades her approach by means of camouflage. Mara shares her habitat with real giants, two and a half times her size. The coast of Ireland is also home to basking sharks. Even though its mouth is as big as a door, humans have nothing to fear from the shark, which lives on plankton. Basking sharks are nomads of the ocean and will at some point disappear once more into the depths of the Atlantic. Vancouver Island in the north of the Salish Sea. There's a pure heart behind the hill Waiting for you until You lay down your head in peace Somewhere Florian is hoping to find black bears here. You can roll up your fragile skin Don't look back to where you've been There's a kiss in the autumn wind Together with his friend Todd Graves, he searches the shoreline. Todd, I think we can stop here. There's something right there. And a bear does indeed appear from the forest. Florian thinks it's come down from the mountain, where it's been eating wild fruits. So as not to disturb the bear, Florian films from the boat. Three quarters of a bear's diet is vegetarian. When they eat animals, they tend to be small, sometimes very small. When the tide goes out, the crabs hide under the stones, a fact that has not gone unnoticed by the bear. But the bear doesn't appear to be all that hungry and moves off again. On the Puget Sound, about an hour's drive from Florian's house, lies Seattle, also known as the Emerald City. The port is the pulsating center of the region, and its unmistakable skyline features the Space Needle Tower. But Florian isn't here to see exciting architecture.
he is magically drawn to water. No one at the pier is aware of what's happening right under their noses. And not that many people would think of going diving in the city. Florian is one of the few, and he's hoping for a very special encounter. For the first few meters of his dive, he's accompanied by stellar sea lions. These, biggest of all species of sea lion, are looking for the same thing as Florian. 30 meters down, it's pitch black. This eternal darkness is home to what he's looking for. But it's not as easy to find as the many fish that live here. Florian is just about to give up when he catches sight of a movement in the glare of the light. Like some weightless being from another world, a huge octopus moves through the murk, a five to six meter long male. Wolf eels, too, have something supernatural about them. The powerful jaws can crack open a lobster or sea urchin shell. The giant octopus is on the lookout for a partner. These mighty animals only live for five years at the most. Towards the end of their lives, they put all their energy into procreation and afterwards starve to death. The love-hungry octopus searches cave after cave but only startles a few wolf eels. One of the caves does indeed contain a female octopus, but she is not yet ready to mate. Florian's dive against the backdrop of the Seattle skyline was a complete success. Now he knows where to find the animals next time. Ireland was once known as the Island of Saints, as evidenced by the numerous ruined churches and monasteries. Off the southwestern tip of Ireland lie the Skellig Islands. Historians surmise that 12 monks and an abbot once lived on St. Michael. But 800 years ago, the settlers left their stone houses forever. Today, silent sackcloth-clad ascetics have been replaced by noisy clowns of the sea. Puffins spend the summer here, bringing up their offspring. At the end of August, when their young can fly, the puffins will once again disappear into the vast expanse of the Atlantic. The craggy Irish coast is lobster country, and sometimes the lobster fishermen get some unexpected company. Mara has attached herself to one of the boats. Curious, she follows the line down to the lobster pots. Lobsters can live as long as a hundred years if they don't succumb to the irresistible smell of fish from the lobster pots.
this lobster throws caution to the winds and seals its own fate. Whether intentionally or by chance, thanks to Mara's intrusiveness, this is one lobster that won't be eaten tonight. Her presence confuses the crustacean, which promptly beats a retreat. Mission accomplished, Mara moves on. She isn't the only solitary dolphin on the Irish coast. Ute Margriff visits the little port of Dingle. Once a sleepy fishing village, after the unexpected appearance of a dolphin in 1983, the place has changed beyond recognition. Fungi, as the dolphin was named, became a star and the pride of Dingle. Do not stand on the outer deck seating. Well, thank you, Alan, for listening to the safety announcement, and we hope you enjoy your trip. Thank you. People come from all over the world to see Fungi, the dolphin, who for many of the fishermen has become a good source of income. But what if one day he fails to show up? At the moment, however, fungi appears as regular as clockwork. No other dolphin has stayed so long among humans without a break. Uta's own life is closely linked to that of fungi. He was her first great dolphin love, as it were, and the reason that she has stayed in Ireland. Fungi decides when the show is over. When he's had enough, he disappears. Where to, no one knows. Deception Pass, a passage connecting the narrow Puget Sound with the broader strait of Juan de Fuca. The area is well known for orcas. No other animal fascinates Florian as much as these black and white whales and the marine biologist knows exactly where to find them. The orcas in the Salish Sea are the most studied in the world. In contrast to many of their relatives, they are not nomadic and are thus known as residents. Three clans totaling almost 90 animals roam the fjords hunting for food. For Florian, they are the undisputed rulers of the seas. The orca clans here are divided into different groups, each with its own distinctive dialect. They are superb hunters and feed almost exclusively on salmon. Due to the whale's unique behavior, scientists talk of an inherent orca culture. They know each individual animal. But the huge creatures are in danger. The overfishing of salmon stocks is causing their populations to shrink steadily.
Florian meets Kenneth Balcom, one of the pioneers of orca research. Ken has been studying the animals for 35 years and has offered to identify the animals Florian has been filming. The naming that we do is alphanumeric. We just followed Mike Biggs' pattern of the first pod that he saw, he called A pod, the second one was B pod, and within each pod he gave him a number. And when he got down here, the alphabet had J, K, and L, and that's what we have. Okay, that's L78. Has a open saddle, big finger on the saddle. That's J27. The one up in front is probably J30. <laughs> well, that. he's got a very tall dorsal fin. There's J30 and 33. They're about two years different in age, and he's the older. All right. And uh, so his fin's a little bit taller. They appear so strong and powerful, and they're actually sizably, you know, much mm -hmm. stronger and bigger than the females. And yet, they really depend on the females. Yeah, they're mama's boys. They're. Teddy whales, really. <laughs> they, uh, uh, yeah, they do what mom says. And mom gets to introduce them to the proper females. Florian hopes to see a lot of the residents on his dives in the Salish Sea. On the Irish coast, as so often in this part of the Atlantic, a storm is raging. The force of the wind lashing land and sea is overwhelming. For Mara, the huge waves are no problem. Effortlessly, she glides through the rough sea. At some point, even the mightiest storm blows itself out. At the moment, it's still dangerous to dive, but Uta knows that right now, a lot of interesting things are going on underwater. There's also a lot for Mara to discover after the storm. Interesting flotsam accumulates on the coast. This cap now has a new owner. Mara not only seems to know what the object is, but also what it's for. She greets Uta with her new acquisition. The dolphin watches with interest what Uta does with the strange object. And the scientist has to ask herself once again, who is studying whom? After further examination, Mara loses her interest in the hat and turns to other things. In the summer, tourists also come to Uta's Bay, many dreaming of meeting a dolphin in the wild. Few have any idea how strong an adult dolphin can be. Uta uses her underwater camera to film Mara propelling stones the size of footballs along the sea floor. The tourists can only guess what's happening under the water, but this certainly isn't the gentle animal they've been expecting. 
Uta's recordings show that, besides elegance and curiosity, Mara has another wild side. The children prefer to stay on dry land, and Uta joins them, happy that Mara's outburst of emotion is safely in the can. Mara's behavior has won the respect of the tourists. She has now calmed down again and seeks human contact. Wild dolphins don't react to whistles or other forms of enticement. They take a decision and express themselves via body language, movement and eye expression. Only someone like Uta, who studied them in depth, can put themselves in their position. Mara displays the same behavior as fungi. She decides when the show's over. They still interact with their own kind. It's just that during the day they make a choice. Uta's mission includes passing on knowledge about solitary dolphins. Thus, the bay becomes a temporary school. The night skyline of Seattle. Florian has returned to the realm of the giant octopus. The light from his lamps attracts a squid and some bizarre looking fish. Then, as if from nowhere, a male octopus moves through the beam of light, only to disappear into the darkness again a few seconds later. Maybe the same one as before. Florian wants to know whether it managed to mate with the female in the cave, but a thorny head is blocking his view. When the fish finally moves away, the filmmaker discovers long tentacles, fanning hanging threads full of tiny bubbles. Thousands of eggs form a curtain in the octopus's cave. The female will be busy for six months looking after her eggs and protecting them from predators. She will stay in the cave without eating until her young hatch. Octopuses mate only once in a lifetime. It is the only time that these intelligent creatures seek the company of their own kind. Florian is fascinated. It is very rare to get such good footage of a female. Most hide themselves away and cannot be found despite their size. Without pause, the female blows oxygen-rich water at her eggs and frees them from sediment. After hatching, the young have to fend for themselves. This is the moment that some of their enemies have been waiting for. The mother octopus will have starved to death and her corpse will serve to feed other animals. On the Emerald Isle, some time has passed since Mara's outburst. 
Uta has been away for a few days and is wondering if Mara is still in her bay. On her way there, she passes numerous other lonely inlets that could appeal to Mara. But the dolphin is already waiting for Uta, who has come with a friend who's a fisherman. Mara heads for an undulating underwater garden. Hundreds of kinds of algae in all shapes and colors grow off the coast of Ireland. Some, like the spaghetti-like thongweed, are tasty and nutritious. Brown and red algae, too, are food for many sea dwellers. But Mara isn't here because she's hungry. She brings Uta a piece of bladder rack. <laughs> then she appears to ask for it back. The scientist understands that Mara wants a peeling massage. This is somewhat of a sensation, as the use of tools by dolphins was only recently discovered by scientists. Mara shows that dolphins are capable of quite different feats. She can't use the tool herself and instead asks Uta to help her, an anticipatory act of planning, usually seen as a human characteristic. After the massage, Mara swims purposefully to the fishing boat. Although they've known each other for some time, up until now, dolphin and fisherman have kept a respectful distance. Often, one fleeting contact is enough to break the ice. Was that the first time you touched the dolphin? Yeah, the very first time. I, I, couldn't, be, I couldn't believe it. Because uh, <laughs> uh, before I seen him in the orbit of both, was uh, absolutely amazing. I couldn't <laughs> believe it. I'm just waiting to tell my family when I go home. Oh, they won't believe it. Uta and the fishermen say goodbye, leaving Mara alone in the bay. Dolphins aren't the only sea mammals on the Irish coast. Mara shares her realm with harbour seals. Usually these two loners hardly notice each other. Today their curiosity gets the better of them. Once again it is Mara who takes the initiative. The seal is more cautious. Seals communicate visually. This one keeps Mara in view, while she, in turn, scans it with her sonar. The unusual encounter lasts for a few minutes, then both go their separate ways. Florian wants to show his wife Gina the orcas. He sets out to sea again with Todd Graves. It couldn't be a better day for... Do you see them? I do. I try to see how many there are. The L family has turned up, the biggest group of residents in the fjord area. Using a list of kens, the two try to identify the individual whales. While Florian is busy filming, Gina makes a great discovery. Hey, Florian, look, there's a baby, too. Only three to five young are born every year, each over two meters long. 
Orcas can be clearly identified from the markings below their dorsal fins. Oh, I saw that one. The, really has a well. triangle. The light part is like a V. Mm -hmm. Little curve there. I'm pretty sure that's him. Mm -hmm. L78. Mm -hmm. So some of these wheels are so old, I can't believe it. Yes. I mean, you really, it just makes me, re, it makes you have more respect for them, I think. I mean, you do anyway, and then you find out that, oh, she's born in 1928. Orcas aren't the only whales that Florian gets to film here. Every year, mighty grey whales pass through the Salish Sea. Once almost extinct, the population now numbers 20,000. Growing up to 15 meters in length, these huge creatures eat microscopic shrimp that they filter out of the water. They feed only in the summer. The rest of the year, they rely on their reserves of fat. At around 10,000 kilometers a year, their migratory routes are longer than those of other whales. The mother animals give birth in the warm waters off the coast of Mexico before setting off for Alaska. A perilous journey, above all for the calves. These orcas aren't here to hunt salmon. The gray whale calf is in great danger. These orcas are not from here. They are transients that patrol the west coast of the United States. They hunt gray whales. The mother desperately tries to protect her calf and outswim the orcas. The hunt goes on for several hours. The constant attacks leave the calf exhausted. Despite its huge size, the gray whale has no chance against the attackers. The mother loses the unfair fight and her calf. <coughs> On the Irish coast, less dramatic events are unfolding. Besides Mara and Fungi, another dolphin has achieved fame and fortune here. For two years, Dougie visited the little port of Tory in the north of Ireland. For Ben, the ferryman's dog, it was love at first sight. As soon as Dougie appeared in the harbour, Ben rushed to join him. As long as it stayed underwater, the dolphin was invisible to Ben, as the dog cannot dive. Nevertheless, the pair seemed to enjoy their game of hide and seek. At one point, Dougie would surface or draw attention to himself in some other way.
As the scars show, this wasn't the first time they'd played together. From a scientific point of view, this friendship cannot be explained. Above all, if you're of the opinion that nothing in nature occurs just for fun. What the pair really felt when playing together remains their secret. At first, the locals thought the dolphin might be sick and asked Uta for help. The two scrutinized each other closely. Dolphins perceive their environment especially clearly via sound. Using various click sounds, Dougie scanned Uta carefully. Uta was able to reassure the inhabitants of Tori that their dolphin was young, healthy, and especially curious, just like Ben. She assumed that Dougie had come across Ben by chance in the harbor, and they'd been playmates ever since. She also thought it possible that Dougie would disappear again as suddenly as he appeared. As things turned out, she was right. After two years, Dougie stopped showing up, and no one knows if he will ever return. All that Ben has left are memories. Evening in Puget Sound. On a moonlit night, Florian prepares to dive on his local beach on Whitby Island. Siro waits for his master to return. Swarms of smelts are looking for food. These smaller fish are food for a young salmon that hides in the seagrass during the day. But its enemies too are on the prowl. A spiny dogfish is on the lookout for some juicy salmon. Strange looking sea slugs are fishing for food. Here, it's eat or be eaten. Bizarre creatures come up from the depths. Some of the jellyfish are breathtakingly elegant. The seabed is a kaleidoscope of strange beings. There is no habitat so foreign to us as the sea. It's an archaic world of darkness that seems to be from another time. Suddenly, particularly strange shapes appear. Chimera, deep sea dwellers more than a meter long, related to sharks and rays. For Florian, encountering such animals is always a very special experience. They're living fossils that first roamed the oceans 150 million years ago. 
The male has grip organs on the ventral fin in order to keep a hold of the female during mating and a strange growth on its head. The light attracts a distant relative of the chimera, a spiny dogfish. The next minute, Florian cannot believe his eyes. A six-gill shark slowly swims past. This powerful animal, five meters in length, is also a deep sea dweller that comes to the upper levels to hunt. Its sluggish movements are deceptive. The shark can swim extremely quickly. Even if no attacks on humans have been registered, its size alone demands Florian's respect. Scientists think that six-gill sharks don't just come to the fjords to hunt, but as viviparous creatures also bear their young here. Florian hopes one day to film such a birth. The Salish Sea is Florian's personal paradise, a wilderness that he has fallen deeply in love with. Ireland became Ute Magreff's new home, where she pursues the study of solitary dolphins with passion and dedication. What Ute and Florian have in common is love and respect for the sea and its inhabitants.